Jim Candy, Part 5, Chapter 7. The easy part of our season was over. Our next game was against Woodenville. They were in 4-1, their only loss coming against Foothill on a last-second field goal. Beating them was going to require our best game of the year, especially since we were playing them on their field. Everybody knew the stakes, and the intensity picked up all week in practice. The coaches yelled more, the guys scuffled more. Early at Thursday's practice, I saw Carlson on the sidelines with Dave Kane. Kane kept nodding his head, and at the end, Carlson put his hand on Kane's shoulder pad and gave it a good shake. Kane hustled over to where I was. Coach wants to talk to you, he said, a cockiness in his voice. I made my way to Carlson. All right, Mick, here's the deal. In the first half, you and Kane will split time at running back. He'll get the first quarter, you'll get the second. Whichever of you has got the better feel for the game will play the second half. Neither one of you impress me, then you'll alternate the second half, too. He paused. No knock against you. Kane's been playing hard. He's earned this chance. I understand, coach, I said calmly, but inside my head, a buzz saw was roaring. For the rest of that practice, Kane would run a series of plays with the first team and then stand back while I ran a series of plays. Nobody said anything to me, but I could feel what they were thinking. I was on my way out. That's what my dad would think, too. When the practice ended, the buzz saw was still going on in my head. I drove straight to Popeye's, tracked down Peter, and pulled him off to the side. That new stuff. I said, my voice anxious. Do you still have some? Yeah, he said. I've got some in the back. I want to try it, I said, interrupting, just to see. Hey, fine by me. I never understood why you stopped in the first place. He led me into the conference room. How many doses do you want? There's 25 bucks a shot. Just one. Mick, how many games you got left? Four, more if we make the playoffs. Then I'm going to bring you four vials. Just pay for one, and if you don't use the other ones, give them back to me. No charge. I don't want to be running back and forth handing you product every week. This is illegal, remember? He disappeared and came back a few minutes later with four small vials in his hand. I slipped him a 20 and a 5. He stuck the money in his pocket, but he kept hold of the vials. This stuff is an infinitime steroid mix. You inject it, and it goes to work almost immediately, two to four hours. That's how long the effect lasts. All the things I warned you about, the roid rage, the depression... They come big time with this, but the benefits are big time too. When he finished, he slipped the vials to me. I stuck them in the small kit he'd given me when I started with the injections. I put the kit in the very bottom of my duffel bag and left. As soon as I was outside, a crazy thing happened. Once I had the stuff, I decided I didn't really need it. I pictured Kane, pictured the way he ran with his blonde hair flowing behind him. I was better than he was. I knew it in my heart. If Carlson wanted to see us head-to-head -head in a game situation, that was okay with me. I wasn't afraid to compete. All Thursday and Friday, I went back and forth. I'd come up with five reasons that I should bring the XTR, and then an hour later, I'd think of five reasons that I shouldn't. I must have taken the kit out of my duffel and put it back in a dozen times. Finally, it was time to pack for the game. I had to decide. I knew the risk. If I got caught with a needle, that would be it for me, and not just for one year, but for my whole high school career. And if I couldn't play in high school, how could I ever get on a college team? But everything I'd done for those first D-Bowls on had been risky. The roid rage was a risk. The black hole was a risk. Going out and playing the game of football was a risk. I hadn't run all those risks to stand on the sidelines and watch Drew Kane play my position. I rolled up the kit in a small towel and shoved it deep into a duffel bag. So Mick has decided that he is going to buy the XTR from Peter. And this is not an easy decision for him, but what pushes him over the head to make this decision or over the ledge to make this decision is that Carlson is going to be switching between he and Kane at the game. All right, so there's potential that Mick will no longer be the starting running back, and he can't handle that. So he goes and gets the XTR from Peter, but then almost immediately regrets it. And it's like, okay, I don't need this. I am good without this. And he keeps trying to tell himself that. But this threat of not being the best continues to loom over his head, and so he ends up packing the XTR before the game into his duffel bag. Because it was such an important game, Carlson insisted we all go on the team bus. As guys waited in the school parking lot, they dropped their duffels onto the sidewalk, but I kept mine tightly in my hand. And on the bus, instead of shoving it under my seat, I held it on my knees, close. Once inside the locker room at Pop Keeney Field, I started to get into my gear. As I slid on my shoulder pads, all I could think about was the injection. When should I do it? Before Carlson's talk or after? I kept putting it off and putting it off. All right, men, Carlson's boomed out, and I moved toward him and listened as he gave his regular speech. When he finished, the guys turned and started to congregate at the mouth of the tunnel, their voices alive with excitement. The bathroom was empty. 
This was my chance, but before I could take a step, Carlson yelled, let's go. Everybody started hollering, and ten seconds later, I was caught up with my teammates, charging through the tunnel and onto the field, screaming my lungs out, my duffel and the XTR back in the locker room. The pregame warm-ups were like they always were, but when the horn sounded, signaling the start of the game, instead of feeling an adrenaline rush, I felt sick inside. It was Dave Kane who'd been taking the field, not me. Then, just before the game started, Drew sidled up to me. Don't panic, Mick, he said. You're better than Kane. I've seen you both run, and I know. You'll be fine. Woodenville won the toss, but they deferred, which meant we'd have the ball first. Whenever a team does that, they're disrespecting you. They're saying, we know our defense can stop your offense. And they did. Drew's passing wasn't sharp, and the linemen were blowing blocking assignments. But it was Kane who was completely out of sync. On the first series, he was flagged for a false start, and then he broke the wrong way on a simple handoff, going to Drew's left side when Drew was looking for him on the right. On the second series, he dropped a swing pass and then had another false start. I didn't need the XTR to outplay him. Just a routine performance would have put him on the bench for the second half. But I didn't want to put him on the bench for the second half. I wanted him on the bench for the rest of the year, for the next two years. I wanted to grab my starting job back, grab it, and hold it by the throat. I had to try everything, pull out all the stops. Coach Carlson, I called out. I'm going into the locker room for a second. My stomach. Carlson turned toward me. Okay, but hustle. I raced down the tunnel, grabbed my duffel, and headed to the bathroom. I stepped into the stall way in the back, pulled the door shut, and latched it. My hands were shaking so much that I dropped the syringe. It was plastic, so it didn't break. But for a second, I wondered if somehow someone had seen it. A crazy thought. Everyone else was on the field. So we see this kind of like addiction with being the best when it comes to Mick. Kane is out there, and he's not having a great game at all. So, I mean, if if Mick gets out there and just performs how he normally does, he's going to get his starting position back. But that's not enough for him, right? He wants to make sure that Carlson never even questions who the starter should be. And so he goes and he's taking the XTR in the locker room. It had been nearly two months since I'd done an injection, but it all came back. I used the isoprol alcohol to clean my skin and the needle. Then I injected myself. Once the juice was in me, I cleaned the side again and massaged the muscle. I stuck the syringe and the vial back in the kit, wrapped the kit in a towel, and put it all at the bottom of the duffel. A minute later, I was back on the sidelines. You okay? Carlson said to me as he walked the sideline. You're not too sick to play? I'm fine. I said, I can go in any time. Carlson stuck to his plan. Kane stayed out there the entire first quarter, even though he scuffled on almost every play. Finally, the quarter ended, and Carlson said the words I've been waiting to hear. All right, Mick, get out there and do something. Drew gave me a smile when I joined the huddle. Counter 34 on two. He took the snap, pivoted, and then slipped me the ball. I cut inside and was by the wooden vial linemen before they knew I had the ball. I racked up 12 yards and a first down before being tackled. Next came a slant pass to Jones that clicked for six yards. But after that, it was my number again, this time on a toss sweep that I broke back against the grain for 15 yards. I wanted the ball again, but Carlson had Drew stretch the defense with a long bomb to Deshaun. The pass fell incomplete, and we came back with a screen pass to me. When I took in that pass and turned up field, the guys in the Woodenville secondary were all 10 yards off the line of scrimmage, afraid of being burned deep. Inside their 45, I gained their corner back a hit fake, cut left, then immediately cut back to the right, leaving a second guy in my wake. After that, I was in the open field and nobody was going to bring me down one-on-one. The guys that were faster than I was weren't strong enough, and the guys that were strong enough had no chance of catching me. It was as if I was going at full speed and they were all in slow motion. Touchdown, Schill's Hole, the public address announcer called once I crossed the goal line, and seconds later, the guys swarmed me. After that touchdown, I raced to the sidelines. Carlson slapped me on the shoulder pads. I took a long swig of Gatorade and then stood waiting, anxious. I figured our defense would stop them, and then I'd go out there and score again and again, and we'd have them buried by halftime. Woodenville had other ideas. After the kickoff, their offense came out firing in all cylinders, and it seemed that whatever defense Carlson called was the wrong defense. When we blitzed, their quarterback unloaded his passes quickly and accurately to a wide receiver. If we stayed back in a conventional defense, their running backs nickel and dimed us to death. Woodenville scored the tying touchdown on a bootleg by a quarterback. The guy could have walked in. That's how completely out of position our defense was. Woodenville had held the ball for what seemed like forever. Once on ESPN, I had seen an old Muhammad Ali-Joe Frazier fight in which those guys just stood toe-to-toe, exchanging punches. That's how the second quarter went. I stayed in the zone, knowing that when to go for the corner and just when to cut back, chewing up big chunks of yardage on nearly every carry. But everything I did, 
they matched. When the clock hit 0-0, ending the first half, the score was 14-14. Carlson gave us a quick talk and then told us to rest. I was itching to get back on the field, but I looked around and saw all the guys with their heads down, wet towels around their necks, sucking air. Until that moment, I hadn't thought about the XTR. But once I saw how exhausted the other guys were, I knew the steroid buzz had kicked in. Not that I felt 100% fresh, and I didn't. I felt bruised and battered. But I knew from my teammates' eyes that I was stronger than they were, which meant I was stronger than anybody on the Woodenville team, too. I didn't play better in the third quarter. I had the same burst I had before, but everyone else had slowed a step, and some guys had slowed, too. The six- and eight-yard gains I'd made in the first half were now ten- and twelve-yard gains. I was slicing through Woodenville like a sharp knife through a tender steak, cutting them into pieces. Carlson stopped pretending he was using the passing game. It was all me. I kept pounding at them and pounding at them until, until near the end of the third quarter, Woodenville cracked. I had six carries in a row, none of them for less than six yards. Instead of putting their bodies on the line to take their best shot at me, the linebackers and safeties were reaching out with their arms. When they finally did manage to bring me down, I'd pop up quickly to show them I was still fresh. It was as if I was the Energizer Bunny, and they realized that nothing could shut me down. The drive ended when I took the ball 18 yards straight up the gut and into the end zone, shutting tacklers the whole way. For the rest of the game, Woodenville's defense wanted no part of me. Then 14-14 halftime tie turned into a 41-21 romp midway through the fourth quarter. And then came what should have been the cherry on top of the ice cream. With one minute left in the game, I broke a 94-yard touchdown run, cutting back twice and fighting off two tacklers at the 10-yard line. The league record for longest touchdown run was 91 yards. I knew because it was my dad who held it. As I crossed the goal line, I turned and looked back, expecting to see my teammates racing towards me. Instead, I heard the referee's whistle and saw him waving his arms, motioning for me to bring the ball back to the line of scrimmage. A yellow penalty flag was lying on the ground. I knew why. Out of the corner of my eye, I'd seen Deshaun split out 10 yards and not even part of the play move early. His penalty had wiped out my record-setting run. At that instance, I wanted to get at Deshaun. I turned and started racing upfield toward him. I was going to smash him to the ground, pulverize him, and tear him to pieces the way a hurricane pulverizes a house. Okay, so Mick and everyone else is exhausted, but Mick's having a great game. Okay, he's wearing down the Woodenville defense, and he does his record-breaking touchdown run. Right, He wipes out his dad's record, and yet it doesn't count because there's a flag on the play. Deshaun okay, caused the flag, and Mick feels this rage, right? And it's the roid rage, and he just wants to kill and smash Deshaun. So he starts running towards him. But somewhere around the 50-yard line, my brain clicked in. Deshaun's penalty didn't matter. We'd won. I was back in Carlson's good graces, both a starter and a star. I slowed, forcing myself to think, fighting the XTR, fighting the rage. My sprint turned into a run and then a jog. By the time I reached the huddle, I had myself under control. So Mick's able to realize he's having like a roid rage episode and manages, just, manages to bring himself under the control again um, because he knows his team has won the game. On the ride back, I sat right in the middle of the bus. Sometimes three or four guys would talk to me at once, telling me how great I'd played, how quick and fast and powerful I'd been. I got punched in the shoulder so many times that it hurt, but I didn't want the ride to end. At home, my mom and dad were waiting for me. Where's that game been? My dad asked when I stepped through the door, a big smile on his face. I had cake and ice cream and then went upstairs and showered. When I stepped out of the shower, I knew I was still wound up to sleep. I pulled on my jeans and slipped downstairs, careful not to make a sound. I started up the jeep and headed into the night. The dark was what I wanted, the soothing blackness of night. I drove to Golden Gardens Park, parked the car, and walked past the duck ponds and onto the beach. The only light came from a sliver of moon. I could barely make out the foam waves of the foam of the waves as they rolled in. The waves were hypnotic. A thousand years ago, they had looked the same, sounded the same. A thousand years from now, they would look the same, sound the same. I stared out at the water, wondering what it would feel like to go out into it. Go out and swim and swim until you couldn't swim anymore, until the water swallowed you up. I don't know how long I stood looking into the sound. Finally, a train whistled in the distance, and I turned and headed back to the car. So Mick's riding this high now of being on the XTR, um, being the best, right, the starting running back once again. Life is good, everything's good, and he has all of this energy that he doesn't know what to do with. But... Remember, he took the XTR after the game started 
and he's already having roid rage already. So what else are going to be the intense side effects of this XTR? Because Peter did warn him about that, and he warned them that they were even worse than what he had used before.